I'm going to read first. <laughs> Chapter 17. Flora Davies, the 40-year-old chairwoman of the group, was locking the airtight door of the basement on 9th Street. The founder of the group, Otis Davies, had purchased this grand mansion on the corner of 5th Avenue early in the 20th century. Named the Global Explorers Club, ostensibly it was a home for travelers who came to the city and needed a place to rest before leaving. <laughs> Here, they could relax among fellow adventurers, swap tales, study maps and rare books in a library, or leave treasures they had found to be collected at some future date. Treasures that the group examined thoroughly. Statues, vases, tablets, and other finds that might have writing or images, carvings or paintings that fit their particular interests served the group's highly secret need. It had proved a worthwhile arrangement all the results of the group's efforts, previously scattered throughout the world in bank vaults and secret warehouses, were now consolidated in this basement. Flora emerged from the side of the building and walked up the steps to the quiet street. She was heading to her apartment with the intention of getting some long overdue sleep before Mikkel arrived with his, his latest artifact from the Falklands. Other members would be arriving within hours to study it and there would be much to do. Each new find was a key, and this particular key they could well be the one that exponentially expanded what they knew, confirmed what they suspected, and ultimately narrowed their ancient search. At this moment, however, Davy's mind was not on the artifact. She stood at the top of the steps that led from the well of the basement door to street level and looked south toward the park. Something was wrong. She heard voices in the park, which was not unusual even at this hour, and dogs barking, which was also not uncommon. What she could not understand was why she didn't see the towering white marble arch that was built to celebrate the centenary of George Washington's inauguration as president. It was gone. At a fast clip, she walked toward the park where the Washington Square Arch used to be. As she neared it, she realized she was wrong. The arch was there, only it wasn't white, and it wasn't marble. Through the center of the arch, she saw a dozen or so students backed well away, standing by the fountain toward the south. They were looking, pointing, taking photos and cell phone videos, not that they would convey the real-time creepiness of a nearly 80-foot structure covered bottom to top with rats. <laughs> when Davies realized what they, what they were, she stopped dead in her tracks and gasped. There must have been hundreds, even thousands. She had never seen, never heard of anything like this. Her first thought after her brain unfroze was that it was some kind of a stunt, something concocted for a reality show or a guerrilla cinema project by film school students. That has to be it. They couldn't be real, could they? Suddenly, spots of white appeared beneath the undulating carpet, first small and then larger, unevenly shaped patches. The students on the other side began to scream, and as Davy started to realize that the rats were leaving their perch in great heaving swaths, someone jokingly cried, Stampede! 
The creatures raced in all directions, with one tidal wave of them rolling unswervingly toward her. A charge of dark gray fur pushed down the center of Fifth Avenue and along both sidewalks. She stood transfixed, not so much with fear or revulsion, though she felt both as the rats rushed over her feet, but because the rats were real, there were no cameras, and though her heart was racing, her mind was working harder still, trying to figure out what on earth was going on. She turned protectively toward the club, and that was when the real horror struck. The concrete recess outside the basement door was overflowing with pile upon pile of the surging vermin. Were they trying to get in the door? Were they squealing, scratching? They were squealing, scratching, and tearing at each other to get higher still as they formed a roiling triangle in the doorway. Under the streetlight, she could see tufts of fur floating upward and the occasional streak of blood. Those that could not get into the small area flowed into the garden that fronted the structure. All the rats that couldn't fit in the stairwell were facing in one direction, aligned as much as possible to the north and south. Davies got as close as she could without making further contact. With shaking fingers, she retrieved her cell phone from her shoulder bag and began shooting video. The rat's activity was inexplicable indeed, but what challenged and distracted her was that this behavior was not entirely without precedent. As lights flicked on in surrounding apartments, people rising to check out the shouts coming from the park and the strange thumping and scratching taking place right outside their doors, Davies switched off her video and stepped into the shadows. She thought back to the call she had received from Mikkel when he landed in Montevideo. The field agent had mentioned something strange, a flock of albatrosses that had flown directly at the plane from the north. Davies put her cell phone away and walked up the vast stone steps to the front door of the Global Explorers Club. There would be no sleep tonight. skip that chapter. <laughs> we were at a signing last night, our first, and there was a question that was not asked that occurred to me that I would ask uh, before turning it over to you. Uh, as many of you are probably aware, uh, the, uh, the modern science fiction genre was invented nearly 200 years ago by a woman, a very, very young woman, that was Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. And here we are with a newly minted science fiction author, who is a woman. And I was curious to ask how you felt having a torch of that magnitude passed across two centuries to you. Uh, incredibly honored. Um, but I have a question for you, which is I, I, I'd be interested, um, from your perspective. Uh, what has it been like for women between then and now? You think you're in this genre, you're going to get let's, a stick with that. That. <laughs> let's, let's stick with that. Fine. Um, it, it's been seriously crappy for women uh, as authors. Um, <laughs> the, uh, for example, uh, the first Star Trek series I uh, had as a story editor, DC Fontana, because the suits at NBC didn't think boys would watch a show that was story edited by Dorothy Fontana. Uh, I know when Ursula Le Guin, a brilliant Ursula Le Guin, sold her first story to Playboy, they listed her, her byline was UK Le Guin because they didn't want men to know that a woman had written it. And you see this throughout, uh, throughout the 20th century. Um, Andre Norton, uh, one, of the, one of the giants uh, of the field, um, fortunately had a kind of androgynous name, uh, but, but when she was grandmastered, by one of the writers' guilds. Uh, her own publisher took out a full-page ad in the program congratulating Andrew uh, Norton. Uh, there have been so many others. I remember when James Tiptree was revealed to be Alice Sheldon. It was a, a, a huge uh, gasp in the publishing industry. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at this. Uh, Lee Brackett, one of, the, one of the great writers in any genre, uh, was 
primarily acknowledged because she was married to Edmund Hamilton, who was another great science fiction writer. Even though <coughs> Bracken, in her own right, wrote, wrote, in addition to science fiction, some of the most virile action movies ever made, including the John Wayne film Atari. And she also wrote uh, The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, so, so women have not been heralded uh, shamefully to the same degree that uh, the equally wonderful Isaac Asimov or, or uh, Jerry Bradbury and Arthur Clarke and Robert Heinlein have been, uh, but they deserve to be. And um, if you have time, I would uh, urge you to go through the, uh, the science fiction section and check out some of those names. If, if that is you, remember to DVR Arrow. If not, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think it's kind of, kind of a wrong idea. Thank you for that education. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I not too far down that road, so uh, I think we'll just uh, open up the questions. Okay. Uh, anybody have one? How did the idea of the trilogy come about? I guess it, it um, uh, Jeff and I were, were uh, introduced by a mutual friend who happens to be our entertainment lawyer, who had um, a brilliant idea that um, we might like to get together and potentially work on a project, seeing as how um, uh, we had something in common in the genre of science fiction. and. Um, and so we did, we got together in New York at one point and um, started to brainstorm um, what might we write were we to write something together. And um, that's really essentially where it began. And we talked for, I don't know how long, a couple hours, an hour and a half with Claire, your wonderful Claire, really no. research <laughs> associate back there. <laughs> and, um, uh, and and that's how it began. That's where the the outline stemmed from. That and um, uh, we talked through. Um, There's just so many different avenues that this storyline could take us down. Um, some of which I I can't go into because they would be spoilers, and some of which I won't go into because it would be um, uh, financially um, uh, dumb. <laughs> uh, so. But, um, but we're very excited about it. Yeah, I would say the, uh, it's, it's, it was very interesting for me because we were coming from two very different disciplines, if you will. Uh, I had ghostwritten for Tom Clancy for years, and so I had a really uh, uh, strict idea about geopolitical thrillers. Uh, I have a, a long and strong martial arts background, which includes metaphysics, so I was interested in that aspect of it. Uh, and Jillian kept saying, I want to write a character that I can one day play. Uh, <laughs> certainly uh, somebody who reflects the values that, uh, that Jillian has. Uh, and we both agreed that it needed to be global, uh, have uh, it take place in many countries. Uh, so, uh, and also that it's, for me, that it steered away from horror. I was more interested in the, um, the spiritual aspects of a potential story, which um, I uh, didn't realize, but when uh, we were in the room together, I realized was a large part of um, of Jeff's experience and study as well. So that was of interest to me. Which is interesting because you just read the most horrific scene. In the <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think by, by that you mean the, the extreme supernatural as opposed to the kind of metaphysical. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, did that answer the question? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Yes? Hi, uh, Gillian. Um, this is your first book, and this is science fiction. Uh, did you enjoy writing science fiction, or you like to explore uh, other uh, other things? You would like to write more about other things later? I, I've always been interested in the idea of writing. I, I am well aware of um, of what that entails as a as a solitary person writing something. The, the, uh, the great joy and relief for me of having a co-writer is, um, is uh, who has such experience as Jeff does, um, is taking away the panic of where do I begin and how does one structure and the technical aspects of things, which um, might have paralyzed me at some point. So I have a fantasy of the fact that at some point um, potentially in another genre, I might be able to take that on board myself. But 
I'm also well aware of the fact that it's, it's in my head only and the actual manifesting of it is something else entirely. Yeah, I think it, it, it was interesting for me, I have to admit, uh, because we, we also have a woman editor, so I have Jillian and Bree and, and Claire, and so all that stuff I said about women writers, uh, really, I, I got to experience that firsthand. Uh, but it was, it was kind of interesting because Jillian was uh, traveling a lot at the time. You were working on three different TV series and preparing for Streetcar Named Desire uh, in London. And uh, we had a really, really tight deadline. And so uh, Claire and I would, uh, would hammer out a rough draft and send it to Jillian, and Jillian would add her, uh, her comments with side comments like, gee, this is fun. Uh, and, uh, Did I say, gee, this is fun? <laughs> Did she say, gee, this is fun? Yes. Gee, this is fun? <laughs> Yeah, but it was it was a tough uh, it was a tough project. Anything else? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Tecla. I'm about halfway through the book. Actually, coincidentally, the chapter before you just read, and I couldn't help but notice that there were so many similarities between uh, a skeptical um, person coming about it from science and yet deeply feeling and have have a lot of faith. Very scholarly like. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the artifact also was almost like an X-File, although it has deeper, um, it, it's worldwide. I was just wondering if there purposely was a similarity between that or if it was just coincidental. It, it was so similar and, and yet um, had a message about the, you know, accepting other people's faith, whether it's voodoo or Christianity or science. Well, um, I actually don't see that many similarities between uh, Caitlin and Scully at all. I mean, she is she's her history is not in science; it's in um, psychiatry, and um, she is um, uh, not uh, versed in this world. But she comes to her understanding in one book, and uh, as opposed to the uh, the equivalent of two hundred and one books. That Scully took to come to her understanding of the subject matter. Um, I, she is. Um, I, I think that she is wary, as any of us might be wary in a similar situation as she is. And um, but from first-hand experience, um, comes to open her mind and her understanding shifts um, quite quickly in the story. And from that point on, she for lack of a better term, is a believer of the things she is experiencing. Um, uh, certainly there is a, an element in the relationship between her and Ben um, of having a, a second party to, um, to cross-reference ideas with and, um, um, and they both have uh, differing uh, perspectives on the same idea. But that's necessary to create uh, drama um, in in uh, in any instance, and um, but even that relationship is not enough of a um, a mirror of what Scully and Mulder would have uh, gone through. And I think we've been very mindful of that. I think probably Jeff has more memory for all things X Files than I do. Um, based on my lack of memory, um, but it was very much an intention of ours not to uh, mirror, um, um, but to come at this with fresh ideas. And certainly, the trajectory as a whole, where it takes us, is um, is is in a very very different um, uh, uh, direction than um, what, as far as I recall, I ever experienced in the X Files. Yeah, also we knew, unlike the X-Files, we knew the, the journey that Caitlin was going to travel over three novels, uh, so we could, we could kind of nudge her in that direction, although Jillian found out last night for the first time uh, that, that uh, Claire and I did put uh, Easter eggs in the novel that uh, were very deeply buried so that Jillian didn't spot them and take them out. We didn't go searching for those. There was a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you do a lot of like really magnificent work. So how did you manage 
like your schedule with doing like a street car and like all this different stuff with writing the book as well? Um, I, during this time that uh, Jeff was referring to, I spent uh, many, many hours on airplanes between London and Toronto and Chicago and Belfast. And um, that's, that, that's more time than I have at home in a room by myself with three kids and everything else. So it was actually uh, a very good time that I had to be able to spend on it. Um, so it worked out just fine. Actually, yeah, it did work out fine though. I, for me, uh, talking to Jillian when she got to Belfast, she said, sorry, I have to tell this. <laughs> she said, I just checked into the hotel room that I always stay in, but they served me cold chicken. And I said, sit on it to warm it because we have to work. <laughs> did you say that? Thanks for relaying that story, Jeff. I appreciate that. I'm sure that will be the headline in tomorrow's paper. Yes. Well, the big question is, did I? I did not. What was the most challenging thing between starting writing and today? Like, what was the most challenging thing for you? In the process, during the process. So during the writing process or yeah. including everything else that was going on in my life? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that was challenging. Um, uh, I uh, opened Streetcar in London um, on the 28th of July. And four days earlier we had done our first run through in front of um, in in a performance before our first preview on the same night of our per first preview, which is not recommended. <laughs> um, so between that and three days later, then opening to an audience of essentially all the press on one night, I also knew that I had been told or reminded that um, that I was to do the audiobook and that the audiobook needed to be recorded uh, ASAP. And um, it, it was preferred that I would start that week, and I managed to convince people that it was okay that I start the following week. <laughs> so I started the following week. But I didn't have much of a voice, and so I started recording the pro I mean, I, I literally, can I tell the story? I invited, so the producer had flown into London, and I, uh, I, I woke up and I could barely speak, and um, and I was told that it was going to be approximately 30 hours of recording, um, and then they said, well, maybe it'll be more like 16. It was 42. <laughs> um, but I started recording and I had such a, I, I didn't have a good chunk of my range. And so I invited her to my house to start the morning to try and convince her that I was the wrong person for the job, <laughs> and that actually audiobooks were not my forte, I should not be doing this. And it hadn't even occurred to me that because we created such a, um, a, a global story that I would have to do the voices of five different Haitians, five different um, uh, Indian, uh, or East Indian um, voices, and Spanish, and etc. So I apologize in advance. <laughs> I, I really hope that I haven't offended anybody. Um, but I, I, uh, um, it, it was gargantuan, it felt to me at that particular time. And in the end, um, ended up having enough time on the particular day to cram in one more version of the prologue because my voice was so horrible when I had read it the first time that I needed to redo it again. And just kind of a, a fingers crossed scenario and, um, um, yeah, so that was probably the most challenging period of time. Yeah, my favorite part of that process was when I got a panicked call from a SAG producer uh, asking me, Jeff, is Ben British? I said, why? Because he is now. <laughs> so I had to quickly go through the manuscript and make sure we had not committed him to a nationality, and it actually worked out uh, the best. <laughs> <laughs>
since somebody said streetcar, I would, um, your performance has been lauded as like the the best new generation of Blanche de Blois. Hell yeah. 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 Um, we, we hope that it will. Um, uh, the, the play took place in the round and on a revolving stage. And for uh, a, a rectangular stage to revolve, it actually needs quite a substantial circumference. And there aren't that many houses that can take a stage like that. There is one. And um, they uh, came to see they came to London, they came to see it, they like it very much. We're in negotiation. Um, um, I'm probably not allowed to say this, but I guess I'm hoping that by saying it out loud that enough excited people will kind of force them into making it real. Um, uh, but yes, that it, will, it wouldn't be for a little while, but uh, that we are in discussion about it. Thank you. Any, fav any favorite novels mm -hmm. that we share? That, n not that we discussed really before doing this. No, but mm -hmm. we did go over the list of your favorite, your favorite novels. And, uh, well, I can have some yeah, idea. I, 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 yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> more in contemporary literature. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. <laughs> but, but I will tell you this, and again, I didn't share this with Jillian, but. Um, <laughs> One of the one of the triggers for me was uh, Edgar Allan Poe's only novel, the, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket, which was written in the 1830s. Uh, he had he has a moment in there that uh, was so powerful that no less alike than Jules Verne decided to write a sequel to the novel, and uh, we decided, or I decided, that I told Claire later, uh, but not Julia. Uh, that it was good enough for Jules Verne. Uh, certainly, we could we could sort of do the same thing. So uh, there was uh, there was that. Um, I know I read a, a interview recently that Julian did where it had been mentioned the possibility of seeing this go to screen if it becomes a film. I was just curious, and this is for both of you, if um, and this may have been answered earlier by Jeff's comment, but who you would see playing Caitlin? Herself. <laughs> you said it. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> She's 25, I'm 25. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes? For both of you as well. <coughs> Being that it is fiction and you throw in the science in there, is there any point where you have to pull yourself back because you don't believe yourself when you write it? How can you sell it? How far do you go? Where are you not willing to go? Yeah. I'll, I'll start with that because uh, this can sound a little bit writerly and artsy, but if it's not true, you know it and don't do it. And uh, I would never, I would never do that. Uh, this this novel over. Even though the first novel is a complete story, uh, the, the scope of it over three novels uh, was, is very big and it was very important to both of us uh, where it begins and especially where it ends up. Uh, and um, that starts to play out in the political situation in the first novel, uh, which reflects so much of the chaos in the world today. And in that first discussion that we had, it's, well, how do we solve this problem uh, and yet actually have it as a plausible solution and, and not pie in the sky? So, uh, but yeah, that's a very good question about, about truth and I, I don't think we would ever do anything that was not honest for both of us. Yep. Yes? Yep, I'll take that answer. Yeah. <laughs> anything else? Okay. How did you find the transition between writing for the screen and writing a novel? Transition of writing for TV and, and the novel? Um, I, I've only, uh, well, no, actually, I've, read it. I, I, I've written two screenplays. Um, uh, 
One um, was for uh, the X-Files, and um, um, it's, it's, I, I have such a bizarre memory of that period of time because I, I literally cannot fathom how I wrote it while working on the series. And I remember sitting in my trailer, I remember it being at my computer, and I remember the first outline that I wrote, um, uh, and I remember certain aspects of it, but um, to me somehow that felt uh, that felt different, I guess, because it was screenplays are are, are conversations, um, you know, running conversations, and um, and so much of uh, of novels in this novel are um, uh, obviously more prose and descriptive, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And and I I actually. Found that uh, more enjoyable on a creative level, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, but more painterly somehow. Um, uh, so making the transition, I don't think, was necessarily an issue, other than, uh, or not other than, but but what I do recall is is how much. I enjoyed the process differently than my experience of writing a screenplay, which I um, have enjoyed, but not with the same delight, I think. Well, in our X-Files, you were writing for existing characters. Yeah, but the, uh, the, the other, um, and the other screenplay that I've written is existing characters. It's an adaptation of a, of a novel, so that's very, that's very different. Yes, it's coming from a different yeah, these, these level of uh, yeah, creativity. Yeah. Okay, we'll take, I guess, a couple more, and then we should. Um, I have a question uh, for both of you. Uh, as a young female, I wanted to get in, I want to be a science fiction writer, and I was wondering if you, either of you had any advice or anything. But, <laughs> but like, also as being, because I want to be also be a, like a tel science fiction television writer, so I was wondering if Jillian, you had any advice as well, as just being the television <laughs> writer. <laughs> just do it well, and somebody will buy it. <laughs> no, I don't know. Ridiculous thing to say, but um, <laughs> no. Um, I mean, I, I I was very lucky in that instance because I was I, I was embedded in that scenario already, and and um, and had the opportunity in a way that most people don't have that opportunity to be able to walk into the executive producer's office and say, "This is my idea. Can I do this?" And him saying yes. Um, uh, so uh, the people that I know in California who have um, successfully written teleplays, you know, write spec scripts and send them in, you know, for existing programs. Write, you know, in the genre that you like, science fiction. Write spec scripts for existing TV shows, and um, that's what I know that people do. Um, so I guess that would be my advice. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put uh, our agent on the spot. Uh, he's back there. You can talk to him. Uh, he's waving his hand right away. Okay. And I just want to say also that, that Claire is is a, is a wonderful writer, and and but she does exactly what Jillian said for screenplays. She just keeps working on them and then putting them aside and working on them and putting them aside and then we submit it and it goes into a black hole and uh, <laughs> so then we, we submit it and it, it, it's a frustrating process <coughs> um, but uh, ultimately uh, if you want to do it uh, you'll do it so yeah. okay uh, why don't we do two more okay hi Yelinda. I'm Rodrigo from Chile uh, my question is uh, for every writer uh, the act of writing is a different experience for you uh, what represents in your life this act, the act of writing, right now? The act of writing. Yeah. What, what, percentage, what, what percentage of my life is the yeah. act of writing right now? Yeah. Um, at this present moment, zero. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think probably that's a better question for, for Jeff, because he is a writer. <laughs> Uh, all of it, pretty much, and even when you're not sitting there, as my wife will attest, you're you're lying in bed thinking about it, and when you're working out, you're thinking about it, and 
except when I'm sitting here talking to you, although now I just started thinking about it. <laughs> uh, no, because we'll, we'll get ideas, because uh, we're working on the second one now, even though Jillian says zero, we, are, we do have a deadline for that. And, uh, uh, so you're always thinking about how it's organic, about how to improve it or, or what to do next. Uh, these, these novels were very carefully plotted and outlined, but even so, uh, constantly coming up. That, that scene with the rats was not in the original outline, was it? No, yeah. no yeah, that just, I, I woke up one morning and said, this, this really belongs here. So, uh, yeah, okay, okay, one more. Okay, one. Um, I'm in the field of psychiatry, and I thought the book was great. I was just wondering what you did, both of you, to prepare for writing characters in the background. Claire. <laughs> uh, Claire, Claire did a lot of the a lot of the uh, field work on the on the psychiatry, and uh, uh, I had I had written about a female psychiatrist in another novel, so I had played female psychiatrist. Had, <laughs> about to get to play the female psychiatrist, and so uh, I think we were we were pretty well uh, well, well set to go on that. Uh, we didn't we didn't want to just make her uh, kind of. You know, the, the psychiatrist in, in apartment 3B, uh, she had to have something a little bit larger than that uh, to fit with the story we had in mind. So um, that, was, that was that. Okay, so I, I guess that's, uh, that's probably all we should do now. Okay, right? Thank you. Let's have another warm round of applause for Jerry and Jeff. Please give us a moment, we're going to set up the stage. We're going to call you up row by row, so please remain seated. Uh, we're going to set up the stage. Thank you, Julian, Jeff. Thank you all for coming.